Hey, everybody, and welcome back. This is Annuity Fundamentals. I'm your co-host, Kylie Malott, along with Ryan Anderson. And today we have such a wonderful guest, Jamie Cheerio. Uh, he is quite spectacular. He's done a lot of things in the past four years that are going to help change your business. So we're going to get some tidbits from him to to enlighten our lives today, and we're excited to have him. So thank you for joining us, Jamie. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Not a problem, man. Now, Jamie, now you've just been in the insurance world for the last four years, but you've had nine businesses in the last 12 years. And four years ago, you started in insurance. I mean, ground zero, building up. I mean, brand new to the industry. And let us you've accomplished a few things. In the last four years, you've personally closed over $2 million in business. You've got an agency that's got 150 agents in it that's averaging over $10 million a year. You've, you're the president and CEO of Living Hope Life Group, which is an integrity company, which means that this monster conglomerate thought your business was awesome enough to come in and buy it from you and ask you to keep running it. Yep. And if and focusing on life products. So if I am a brand new agent, or not even a brand new agent, say I'm an experienced agent and I'm selling final expense products across the kitchen table from somebody, and I want to do what you've done. I want to get into the more complex, higher paying stuff. How would I do that? Where where would you start? What would you where would you go with all this? Yeah, I think my first disclaimer right off the bat is that uh the simple case design, like final expense, mortgage protection, that's the bread and butter that keeps the lights on. Like, so at the end of the day, like if you're somebody who says, I want to get into complex case design and massive premiums, you become like what we call a whale hunter. You go around trying to hunt whales and then maybe you catch one every now and then. And all it takes is you catch in one to become addicted to it. And then if that's all that you do as you're getting started, a lot of the times you're coming up with nothing. And then maybe you pull in one big deal a month. You're, you're trying to go for like what I would call a grand slam. And that's a stressful life to basically be whale hunting every single month and saying, I need to bring home meat for my family and I'm going to do it once, twice a month. But at the end of the day, the final expense, the mortgage protection, that's where you're going to find the opportunities. But if you're not, I guess, evolving um, and learning over time, I mean, there's been many times in my career where things have changed and I've had to pivot and learn new things after I became very comfortable. So when I first got started, I got started doing final expense across the table. And the first time that someone said, Hey, maybe you should consider doing mortgage protection. I'm like, man, I, I figured this final expense thing out. Um, and then, you know, what ended up happening? The biggest final expense vendor for our company ended up going out of business because of the election and they couldn't run, uh, Facebook ads without the ad costs going through the roof. So then we lost our biggest vendor for Facebook final expense. And I had to switch over to mortgage and the industry forced me to switch. And what was really cool about that switch from final expense to mortgage protection you're talking about case design for a new agent. Very simple. Hey, Bob, Mary, if you die, do you want to be buried or cremated? We want to be buried. Okay, that's 10,000. I want to be cremated. Okay, that's 5,000. All right, do you want to leave 5,000 behind for your kids, 10,000 or 20,000? Pick one. Very simple case design. You get into mortgage protection, and now it's just a little bit more complex. It's not crazy. It's still pretty simple, but do you want to pay off the whole house? Do you want to pay off half the house? Do you want to do equity protection. Um, oh, you're 80 years old and you still want mortgage protection and a $40,000 policy is $700 a month. Like, how do we still make that valuable for you? And we're solving a need. Um, final expense and mortgage protection is a need-based sale. When you're getting into annuities and IULs, it's not a need sale. It's a greed sale. So it's a very different conversation and you have to be able to um, talk to clients in a little bit of a different way. When I got into final expense mortgage protection, I was taught um, take control of the sale. Hey, Bob, Mary, here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to ask you X, Y, Z, and then we're going to fill out an application and we're going to see if you can qualify. The IUL, for instance, is such a different conversation. I get on the phone and it's a, it's a fun conversation about what are your financial goals. Obviously, there's so much more in terms of them needing to trust you because they're putting their retirement income in your direction and you're going to be someone who is, you know, trusted with stewarding that. Um, and it comes with needing to learn a lot of things that I was super uncomfortable with. Um, that same uncomfortability that I had from going from final expense to mortgage protection in the home, I had the same uncomfortability jumping into telesales and doing everything over the phone. And then even more so when I said, let's start doing IUL because it forced me to go back to the drawing board and learn. And I had to slow down. And a lot of us are just trying to keep the lights on. And when you slow down, you think your business is going to die. But also I think of 
not how can I just keep the business going uh, today or this month? How can I feed my family this month? But like, what's going to be sustainable for me five, 10 years from now? You know, I'm a career insurance agent. This is what I want to do. Sign behind me says best business ever. I truly believe the insurance industry. There's nothing better. I've been in a bunch of different industries and I'll tell you why, you know, some other time, but um, learning about IULs specifically, I found that I went from running 40 to 50 appointments a week to go into running 20 appointments a week and going from submitting 10 to 20 applications a week to submitting five to seven applications a week. And what I've noticed is every single year that I've evolved in this business, my annual premium per household has gone up and my persistency has gone up. The first year in the business, I submitted something like $430,000 in annual premium. I think I had to write close to 550 individual applications to get there. So what's my average AP per home? It's less than $1,000. So I worked my tail off. Yes, Jumped into mortgage protection year two. I did 550 in annual premium. And I think that it took me closer to 400 applications to get to 550. So now my annual premium is going up because mm -hmm. I'm writing bigger cases. Last year, it was a little over 500 on 220 cases. So now you're thinking, okay, we're getting up into the two, three, four, five thousand per household, and I'm also noticing um, average across the industry persistency for final expense mortgage protection is seventy percent, and that's pulled directly from Integrity across all carriers. That is the average persistency. Three out of ten of every final expense and mortgage protection policy will fall off. Of course, you've got great great uh, agents out there that got ninety plus percent persistency, but that's industry average. The industry average for IUL is 90% right now, 90% persistency. So if you've ever had a reason for wanting to learn, not just how you can make more money on these bigger cases, because that will come, but in terms of protecting yourself from chargebacks, um, I don't think this year I've had a single IUL chargeback, which is crazy to look at. That's so, incredible. Um, the industry standard for that, it's just, it's such a different product. So I get really excited about it. Yeah, absolutely. I love, I love that. I mean, the message was adaptability right? You were comfortable with final expense and you got pushed into doing mortgage protection and now you're doing IULs and you're always comfortable. And I think that's agents, their biggest hurdle is their own, is their own mind, right? That fear. Well, I don't know. I'm really getting good at this. I don't want to do something else. I finally mastered this. But when you start mastering the little things, right? Final expense, those are pretty easy policies, right? People understand them. They're simple. It's a yes or no. How much do you want? 10, 20, 30, right? That's bang, bang, bang. Uh, like you said, I put myself in there. We're going to get this done today. And then getting into the conversations of the IULs and more of an education game where you're planning with them. You're not just solving a problem, a final expense, but you're saying, hey, how can we generate wealth? How can we protect your principal? You know, and the same is with the annuities, right? That's what we're doing. We are protecting their their principal and giving them income or whatever they're looking for, right? Where it's all about goal setting. And so I think that's where agents get their the biggest hang up is like, no, I just got good at this one thing. Yeah, well, this one thing can trickle into other aspects of their life and be a beautiful thing, not just for them, but also for you as the agent, your income dramatically changes. I mean, you said so yourself when you're doing final expense, you were writing 500 to get 500. Now you're writing, you know, 450 and now 250 and it just gets less and less because those policies get bigger and bigger because you're no longer just solving this big of a problem. You're actually giving them an entire solution. And in doing that, your, your compensation also goes up, right? You're not just a pencil pusher, but you're actually helping them plan for the future. So I love that. Absolutely. I mean, I've been uncomfortable with change every single time that it has happened. Uh, but I think as an agent, um, our industry is going to change. It's inevitable. Oh. Um, I mean, whether it's with um, leads and new uh, regulation that's coming down the pipe, which is coming, you know, there's going to be different things that, you know, change the way that we can call and text and who we can call, when we can call, how old the, age, the leads are. And if you're stuck on just one lead type, um, you're going to get crushed. So you have to be able to be able to adapt, number one. And then number two, if you're not evolving in this business and your ROI isn't going up every single year, like what are you spending on leads? And like my first year, it's like, okay, I spent a dollar. I made three. Okay. You know, not, yeah. not, it's okay. You know, next year it's like spend a dollar, make five, but it's like, I want to be spending a dollar to make $10 and that's what we should all be trying to get to. Um, and that comes with, you know, um, finding better lead sources. It comes with, uh, 
getting better at referrals. Referrals are free, free leads. Um, going back to your, your book of business. So like all those final expense clients when I was brand new and I had no idea going back for an annual review when they didn't really trust me. And I also didn't know how to ask any questions about what money they had and uncovering those things and finding out, Hey, it's not just me. It's also my wife. It's my granddaughter. It's this, it's that, you know, yeah. my neighbor and you start getting referrals. But the idea is that as you build up a book of business, like if you're in the business and you got to imagine if I did almost 500 applications my first year, you know, and then the next year, almost 400 applications and then another couple hundred, another couple hundred, I've got a book of business that's well over 2000 names, whether they're, you know, on the books or not. These are people that I've done business with at some point that I can go re-spark a conversation with. That's a free lead. And I also wasn't uh, wise enough to go back and at the time, because I wouldn't have known what to do and ask them any questions about the future or their retirement. I was there to sell them life insurance. And I didn't realize that. Uh, I mean, I knew there was other options out there, but they were scary to me and that involved me changing. So I just stayed yep. away. You Proper know, fact a finding. It's all about that. And I like that you said uh, the industry changes. So it's going to change with or without you. So you better be adaptable. Sorry, Ryan, I cut you off. It's all good. But you said three or four things here that have really rocked my world. Now, you talked about the referrals here. We did a, a episode here a couple of weeks ago with a guy by the name of John Carter, and he really hit a great way to go through and do the referral piece to that. But I loved um, what you said about the adapting that um, with annuity fundamentals, we go through and we teach a lot of agents that are Medicare and life agents how to add annuities to it. And one of the tenets of that is you are right here. You are really good at final expense. You are really good at Medicare. And we want to add IULs. We want to add mortgage protection. We want to add annuities, add fill in the blank. And the mental uh, hurdle they have to get over is I'm really good at this. But in order for me to sell this, I've got to go back to being really bad. And I'm going to face plan it. I'm going to, it's going to, I'm going to lose sales because of it. But if I don't go that way, I'm never going to level up. I'm never going to elevate. And I just, th that piece to it, if you're not evolving, you're dying kind of a thing. I can't tell you how many awkward moments I've had in the last year where I've asked somebody to find a statement for me and it just uh -huh. kind of awkwardly killed the conversation because I wasn't smooth with it because I hadn't done it. But that's that's part of it. I, I can't tell you how many times people hung up on me when I was doing final expense and then mortgage protection. And then you do it for a while and you're like, OK, everybody who answers the phone for the most part books an appointment because you know I've got this down now. And it's the same thing when you're talking about discovering money. It's kind of awkward at first. And then you learn how to work it into a conversation. You know, you start off a conversation. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm calling for our IUL appointment. Hey, tell me all about your retirement accounts. That's like really, really upfront. But if you throw out a, a question like, hey, you know, you know, IULs are kind of like 401ks. Here's the major differences. Have you ever had a 401k before? And it's like you're, you're working it into conversation. Have you ever borrowed from your 401k, um, you know, and got penalized? And it's like, now I know. No, I haven't because I've never had a 401k. Or yes, I have. Okay, well, ballpark, how much you think you have in there? And it's like now I, I very, um, not in a non-threatening way, discovered the money. And it's like you'll learn those little nuances. Like that wasn't anything too complicated I said there. And anybody can do that but you learn how to discover the money in a non-threatening, non-confrontational way. And the clients will trust you a little bit more as opposed to coming right out the gate and they don't even know you. And you're this random person voice on the other side of the phone and you got to find out what money they have. They don't know who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Jamie. So you've been in it. You're managing quite a few people. You have agents under you. So give them some advice, right? Let's say I'm brand new in the industry. I've been doing this three months, I've written a handful of policies, but I'm struggling to make the next six months. What can I do to improve my business? I could go a thousand different ways with that one. Um, because at the end of the day, I mean, uh, we, we have to keep the lights on. And uh, depending on how you are you know, building your business, if you're a leads-based business or if you are a referral-based business, friends and family model, there's a bunch of different IMOs out there that have different philosophies. The business that I'm from, we're a leads-based business. We spend money on people, names and phone numbers of people who are raising their hand that have some level of interest. Now, are they ready to buy? I don't know. But it's better than going to, you know, the Walmart parking lot and saying, hey, are you interested in IULs? You, you want an annuity? Like, I would much rather call somebody who filled out a form, even if it was a year ago. At right. some point, they raised their hand with even the littlest amount of interest. I'll take that. 
all day long. And um, basically for me, it's getting good at really squeezing the juice out of that first batch of leads so you can play with house money. Um, I think that that's the goal. Like when I first got started, I think I talked to my wife, we invested $1,500 in leads and um, I wanted to obviously make my money back so I could pay us back. But then mm -hmm. I wanted to make a couple extra sales to start off my new business checking account. And that was going to be the money in which I was going to fund my business with hopefully for until the end of time. And thankfully I haven't had to invest any of our personal money back into the business all from that $1,500 investment. We've been able to, you know, invest and reinvest and, you know, pay ourselves from there. Um, so I think that if you are, if you have a list of a hundred names and phone numbers and you're going through that entire list and we're not pulling out at least one sale, even if it's a simple final expense, life insurance, whatever that is. Um, and we're going through that entire list multiple times and not pulling out one sale. We need to reevaluate what we're doing. We need to reevaluate, um, what's going on on the phones. We need to reevaluate. Is this a good career? Because I personally have seen agents who really do not have a super high level skill set. They're not that smooth on the phones, but they're willing to work their butts off. And I believe anybody can pull one sale out of a batch of a hundred. And it's like that skill and that grittiness of being able to do that is what's going to make you survive in this business. And then it goes from, I got a list of a name of a hundred phone numbers and I'm not just going to pull one sale out of it. I'm going to pull five sales out of it. I'm going to pull seven sales out of it and creating that consistency. So for me, it was about getting agents started selling, you know, we sell life insurance. That's what we do. All these other, you know, terms or types of life insurance and marketing terms for life insurance, but that's what we do. How can I help you sell five to seven policies a week, teach you to reinvest that back into your business, create predictable cash flow, and then help you slowly upgrade your lead flow flow from old leads to new leads, from final expense to mortgage protection, from mortgage protection to IUL. And um, I think the, the biggest thing um, that I was not very open to was I'm like, okay, I'm already a top producer on the final expense mortgage protection side. I don't want to split my commission with someone to learn. And I think that was a, a big ego thing for me. I was like, I'm not splitting my commission. I can figure this out. And I probably lost a lot of big sales from just trying to figure it out. But yeah. I mean, I, I've got a guy on my team who's, you know, he's my downline. I don't really, I hate that word, but he's someone who's taught me more about the advanced markets than anybody else that, you know, I've, I've met in the industry and he's, you know, a downline and I'll split deals with him all day long, especially when it's a complex deal that I've never dealt with something that, you know, is very creatively funded over the course of the year. Like, Hey, Oh, you're getting a bonus from work at the end of the year. We'll throw it in there at the end of the year. And we'll start off with this lump sum and you'll do this for the first five years. And then after, so it's, I would rather split my commission with someone than get nothing. And I think that's a big thing that somebody needs to hear is be willing to have someone help you. And yes. all it takes is splitting it five, 10 times, hearing what they say, realizing it's not rocket science. And then also it should piss you off a little bit. You should go, damn, like that was a really big one. I really wish that I would have, it should hurt. And if it hurts, when you split that commission, you'll be that much more motivated to learn it yourself. So I think oh. that's really important is you got to feel the pain of that commission split to motivate you to learn it so that you can do it on your own. A hundred percent. Ryan, what is, what do we normally say to people? 50% of something's better than a hundred percent of nothing. And it's right there. But the thing about it is that you went through, you hit three or four things. I'm making notes as you're talking because there's so much good stuff here. The fact that, the, and, and you just said it in passing that I don't think a lot of people might may have picked up on it. That um, when you get a list of a hundred names and you go through it multiple times, you don't just call them once and call it good. You work that thing until the paper comes apart. The, uh, the, that, and one of the other things here that I've got a question for it, you, you're bringing a new agent on that. One of the big things that I am huge in are systems. And that is to go through a process. I do it this way every single time because I know the result. Now I've got to figure out what that system is. So if I, if you're bringing a new agent on, and all right, you're no very limited insurance experience. They're selling uh, the whatever, we'll just say um, final expense and mortgage protection. 
what is the process you go through? What is the system that you say, all right, if you're working from home, you're working from the office, what do you tell them that that as far as these are the behaviors that successful agents have, these are the ones that don't have. And if you're performing like this, you've got a 10 day life expectancy and I'm not going to waste my time on you. You know, absolutely. So I, I will, another big disclaimer here is, have you guys ever heard the the age old thing of do what I do, say what I say, get what I get? Yes. Okay. So that that is true to an extent. However, if some new agent tried to come in and do what I do today, they would go bankrupt because of the systems and how much money I spend on a daily basis. So it's not do what I do because you will go bankrupt and you'll or you'll fail. It's do what I did, say what I said, oh, and you'll nice. get what I I got during that time. So I think that's really important because comparing your chapter one to someone else's chapter 10. We look at my chapter 10 today. uh, You know, I dialed the phone nonstop, never had a dialer for three and a half years. Finally just decided six months ago to have somebody help me to book appointments. Never had a system, worked off of spreadsheets. Finally, you know, spent about a year building out a CRM for our team with a lot of different automations. And I spend a lot of money on SMS carrier fees and texting and all, all kinds of things to get a hold of people and keep them in my schedule and no-show campaigns, all of these things. And it's not something that's very easy for a new agent to set up day one. You can absolutely get there, work there. It's not something that you know anybody couldn't do. But when I first got started, Um, I printed out a stack of leads in paper and my system was, okay, this stack of leads are the ones that I haven't called yet. This stack of leads are the ones I've called one time, two times, three times. These are the people I need to follow up with. You know, these are the people I'm never going to call again. And it was a stack of paper on my desk and it was a mess. But at the end of the day, I would rather a new agent just print out the paper and start calling and use your iPhone calendar and do something right now, then try to say, well, I need to have the exact same system that Jamie has before I can get started. Um, mm-hmm. The best experience that you can get is just get your teeth kicked in on the phone a couple of times. And my number one goal is for you to book your first appointment as quickly as possible. And it's yeah. like condensing the learning curve. And then, you know what? I graduated from paper to a spreadsheet. And then I put it in a Google spreadsheet and I highlighted it green when I booked the appointment and I highlighted it red when I never wanted to talk to that person again and yellow if it was somewhere in the middle and I'd go back and I'd, you know, mark up my spreadsheet of how many times I've called them. And I did that for years and it, you know, it it served me well. Um, But in terms of, you know, making sure I hit the client over and over again and no one fell through the cracks. Well, you know, I found a lot of people fell through the cracks and that's where I finally decided, okay, well, if I dial the newest, most expensive leads first, And then I have somebody come behind me and dial those leads. And then I have somebody who's helping me not just dial behind me, but they also go dial those aged leads where I should be spending my time on the newest, most expensive, highest intent leads. And they should be going back and filling in the gaps and picking up everything and having new agents grab my old leads and put them on their schedule and all of that stuff. Again, that's not really something to develop day one. And also I've been buying leads for four years. So four years buying 100, 200, 300 leads a week, depending on the age, I've got thousands and thousands of leads, just like I have, you know, a few thousand clients, you know, probably 10 times as many leads as I have clients. Yeah. So I'm able to go back, but would that be the best use of my time to go back to a lead that was two years old? Absolutely not. But if I've got somebody who's helping me out and they go back and they dial all day long on a year old list, and they book me three, four appointments. Those are three, four appointments that I would have never had in the first place. So I'm happy with that. If I drop a list into our CRM and I start texting them and I pull out, you know, I, I get a list of a hundred right off the bat. I dial through it. I book 15 appointments. And then that text system drips on it for the next, you know, four months. And it take that from 15 appointments to 30 appointments, even if it's not right away, but every now and then I'm pulling one more appointment out of that list. The compound effect of that happening every week is powerful. But yeah. again, that's not where I started. I started with, I've got a list of leads and I'm going to dial through this as many times as it takes. And I'm going to go get a no. I'm going to get a yes or a no. They're either going to book an appointment with me or they will answer the phone. If they answer the phone, I'm going to find out what intent they are. And I just want to resolve this lead. If I can resolve this lead, I can get it off my plate and I can move on to the next ones. But I think getting gritty enough to be willing to resolve your leads is the first thing Um, and then at the end of the day, you know, selling insurance 
it's really um I don't think that there's a crazy skill set involved when somebody requested the insurance. We're not taking somebody from not interested to interested. You've got some of these companies out there and to each their own where their entire model is take people who don't know about insurance, haven't asked about insurance and get them interested in insurance, you know, call their list of friends and family, whatever, you know, to each their own. But when you have somebody who requested it, they at some point had a level of intent. So I'm taking someone from kind of interested to very interested is way better than not interested at all. Hey, let me tell you why insurance is great. Now, you already know why insurance is great. Just nobody's been able to design a plan that made sense for you. Nobody's been able to make you not feel the sales pressure. Nobody's been able to make you not feel uncomfortable giving your social security number and your bank account info, but you want insurance because you requested it. So I think just understanding all of that in the beginning and understanding that, uh, you know, just all out massive action and calling the leads is better than a perfect plan and a perfect system. You'll develop the perfect plan and the perfect system for you over time. Um, but th there is no perfect system day one. I can definitely make recommendations for organization and all of those things, but I know some of the most unorganized agents on the planet who absolutely crush it and they just call the leads. So that's the first yeah. thing you got to get over that fear. Absolutely. I think being consistent is right in there. Being consistently consistent. I think getting after it, you're, I mean, you have to have some grit in this business because whether you're calling a, a lead, I mean, you're still cold calling them, right? They did say, yeah, I'm, I'm interested. But the first time you pick up that phone, that's the first time they're seeing your phone number come across their phone. So they, they, you, you need to get into the groove. Absolutely. You mentioned investing and then reinvesting. So for a new agent, well, we'll kind of end on that note. What does that look like? What does investing in yourself up front, what does that look like? And then reinvesting, how much do you put back into your business to feed the machine? Yeah, I think that we have to, um, we have to figure out like, what's your, what's your mathematical formula in regards to like, what's your closing ratio? And you don't figure that out until you put in some serious numbers. But like, for me, um, you know, obviously not everyone comes into the business in this situation, but you know, I, I came into the business where my wife was still working full time and I, I had jumped into this and um, we invested our lead money and we were like, I'm not going to buy more leads until I make a sale off of this batch of leads. Now, everybody has different investment or different investment strategies. I know some people who they're like, just throw money at the business and eventually you'll pull out a sale. That's not the best way to get a return on your investment. Um, so I, I'm not a huge proponent of just keep buying more and more leads when you're not selling the batch that you have in front of you, because if a new agent gets a hundred names and phone numbers and they don't sell a single one, I'm sure any of us could dial through that same exact batch of a hundred and pull out, pull out a client hundred yeah. percent because we've been here long enough. Yeah. It might not be your preferred list. It might be a year old, but if you grinded your butt off and you put your mind to it, you're going to get a client out of that. So there's something fundamentally going on with that agent where I don't want them spending more money and lighting all their money on fire if they're not able to help a family or there's some fundamental thing that needs to be corrected on the phones. But um, I'm a huge proponent of being a good steward of your commissions. Um, and I'm, I'm a huge proponent of that because I've been a horrible steward of my commissions in the past. Uh, 2017, I had to file bankruptcy, got everything taken from me in front of my friends and family, you know, lost my fancy BMW, lofted apartment, all of those things. And it was because I was a horrible steward of my commissions. For the most part, last 12 years, I've been 1099 commission based, didn't save for taxes, did everything wrong that you're not supposed to do when you're 1099. And when I came into this business, um, I was free and clear. And I said, you know, other than you know, obviously some debt that I needed to pay back, but um, I was like, I'm going to do this differently. You know, I'm going to take um, of every dollar that comes in, 30% is going into a business savings account. This isn't my money. So like when I put $1,500 into the business checking account, you know, I didn't go get an LLC, you know, I didn't let that hold me back from getting started. I just went and opened up a new personal account, a new savings account, but I labeled it business. But it, the, the thing is, it was separate from my checking account with my wife. So we set that up. I put my original lead investment into it. Um, I bought some leads and then my commissions were going to deposit there. And I knew that when that money went there, you know, the first money was for leads. I needed to pay my business first so that I could continue to keep going. And it wasn't until I started helping uh, consistently five families a week that I pulled any money out of the business for myself. 
Mm. So obviously not everyone can do that. I understand some people are coming in in a more desperate financial situation. You need to make money, but your business also needs to stay alive. If we talked about how 30% of everything falls off the books, well, why aren't we putting 30% to the side just in case? Because what's going to happen is, you know, I put 30% to the side in my mind originally just to be a tax savings account. That was my entire thing because I didn't want to be in the back tax, you know, treadmill anymore like I had been in the past. So I did that to start. And then what ended up happening was I'd wake up one day and I'd have a charge back. I wouldn't have a commission come in and I go, but I still need to buy leads today. So I would borrow from my business savings where I was taking 30% of every commission and I would get myself some leads and then I'd make some sales. And the next time, you know, instead of 30%, I put 50% for the next couple just to pay myself back. And I basically used that business savings account um, almost like a credit card for myself where I was using that money on days when I couldn't use my cash flow from commissions to buy leads. And then I'd pay myself back later. And it, it took a lot of discipline, but it was like, you know, my first you know year in the business, there were six figures in the tax savings account. I was like, holy crap. And then I didn't owe six figures in taxes. And I was like, I get to keep this. Like, this is insane. Um, so then from that point on, because I was very disciplined the first year, I never had an issue buying leads again. But that was really important was, um, not increasing your lifestyle too quickly. My wife and I were a one car household for the whole first year that I was in the business. And I was in the field driving three to 400 miles a day. We were a one car household. I would drive my wife to work as a teacher. I'd go out in the field, pick her up. Like there was a whole thing. And then when I got like six months into the business and I proved my income, I didn't go get myself a $900 truck. I went and got a nice family Toyota for her and the kids. And then I took the car that we have, my 2009 Cor Corolla, and I drove 250,000 miles in the field. I didn't go get a BMW. I had a BMW. It was taken from me. So I was like, I'm never getting a BMW again. I'm just kind of salty on that. But um, I decided not to, we decided not to increase our income or our, our lifestyle too fast. We had to fund the business and we had to figure out what my cash flow was going to be. And then once we got steady, then we started paying ourselves a salary. Then we started doing some things for our house, you know, buying, you know, my wife wanted all organic food. That was the first thing, you know, but we didn't do it all at once. And I think the mistake that most yeah. agents make is they go to Disneyland after they make their first commission and they spend everything and they buy a flat screen TV and they pay off their credit card and then they get a charge back and they have no money in a charge back and no leads. So you have to be a little like I, I had a guy who came into the business and this is really unfortunate story. Um, he came in and he came in hot. You know, he started writing 50,000 a month right off the bat month one. He had a lot of personal debt. And the first thing that he did is he paid those creditors first. He paid everything that he could to pay off his debt. And that was a mistake. What he should have done is he should have continued to make just a little bit above the minimum payment as he learned the business. And he learned how to create a sustainable lifestyle around selling insurance before mm -hmm. he paid everything off because he totally robbed the fuel from his business. And then he ended up in a way worse position than he started um, once chargebacks started happening because- the life insurance industry is amazing your first three months um, before you have business start falling off the books and reality yeah. hits. So, um, you know, I, I wish that I could teach all agents and it's hard because everyone, you know, you got life circumstances, you got things that need to be paid for, but I wish that I could teach people to take 30 to 50% of every single dollar and put it into a savings account and only use it for business expenses when necessary, when your business checking and your commissions can't fund it. Um, and then don't pay yourself a salary until you can afford to. And I know that sounds crazy. Most people just go, well, it's the commissions. It's all my money. No, it's not your money. It's mm -hmm. your business's money. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if I own a subway, what comes first? My, my Lamborghini or bread, meat, and cheese? I, I got to buy bread, meat, and cheese to keep the lights on of subway. Like that's the most important thing. So it's not your money. It's the business's money. You need to pay your business first and yourself last, which is counterintuitive. You read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Well, they said, pay myself first. Yes. But like, you got to pay your business first before you can pay yourself first. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I love the things you've said here. So just to kind of recap here, as we wrap this up, that I, there's like five key points that you brought out that I think that a brand new agent should keep in mind. Number one, you have to evolve. If we're not evolving, we're not growing. And I think not, and when I say that, I'm talking about your sales cycle. I'm talking about your sales process, the products you go through, your business accounting, your business, every aspect of your business needs to evolve. We need to have systems. 
consistent things that you can do on a regular basis. Now, whether you're a Medicare agent, annuity agent, an IUL agent, a final expense agent, I need to have a system that you need to work at this every day. You need to continue to, it's not just a, the whale hunting thing you talked about at the beginning. We need to make sure that we get this. We don't walk away from the small stuff because that's going to help us when we get the big stuff. Um, reinvest into your business, have a budget. And so go through and, and basically, um, I always like to talk about my non-negotiables. That I uh, that if I was to go through that these principles here are not negotiable for me, and that thirty to fifty percent into a savings account should be one of those non negotiables. I get a three hundred dollar check. I write twenty, uh, you know, a, a check for hundred bucks, hundred fifty bucks to my savings account. Now I've got hundred and fifty bucks left, or two hundred, whatever you decided to work with and move forward. Um, when uh, we've I started a business here a while back, and um, we had a really good first six months and the habit of putting 20% at that point of time into savings and carried us through the next four months when what the crap happened to our sales. And that was, it was life-saving. It, it, our business would have failed if we hadn't have been responsible. And so the last thing, the last thing that I'll say just on that is like life happens, like not mm -hmm. only does things happen in the industry, but life happens. Like, I've had two kids. I got a third on the way. Like there, there were things that had, like, I didn't have kids when I started this industry, but guess what? I took time off and that meant no commissions were coming because I didn't have a team at the time. Um, you know, so the, like those 20, 30, 50% that saved me during those times. Yeah. Um, my wife's dad, he passed away tragically in a plane, a plane, a plane crash a couple of years ago. And it was like, everything, you know, was crazy. And like, we, no one had money for the funeral. Like we had that money that we had put to the side that was able to take care of that stuff. And no, it wasn't what I originally intended it for, but it was there when it was needed. So like yeah. th things in life are going to happen and we have to prepare for it uh, because like it's going to, life's going to keep moving. And guess what? You're going to go on a vacation at some point and you're not going to be selling when you're on vacation and you're going to be sure as heck glad that you put some money to the side um, for when that happens. Absolutely. So thank you so much for joining us. Again, my name is Kylie Malat. This is Annuity Fundamentals. You will see Jamie's information below and we'll see you next week. Thank you so much.